For Kristen Ireland is a human resources consultant for PeopleSpark Consulting in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She co-founded PeopleSpark Consulting with Aaron Miles in 2018. Kristen has more than 20 years of experience consulting and coaching executives, leaders, and managers in human resources and leadership uh, development. Uh, NGFA works very, very closely with Kristen and, and her team. And I believe, if memory serves me right, at some point, all NGFA are employees. All NGFA employees are required to go through some of Kristen's online training. Is that correct, Jess? Very good. So unless you've had no challenges at all in the last four or five years in hiring, please get ready with your questions. Kristen, it's great to have you here. With that, Kristen Ireland. Thank you very much. You guys hear me okay? There it is. I have to remember, it. lean left. You guys are in the right spot because I'll be looking this way to hit the microphone. I'll try to turn to look at you. All right. My first qualifier for this presentation is you have to at least be close enough to somebody to have a conversation. Whether it's beside you, in front of you, in back of you, code to the people on the right-hand side, your left, you're going to have to get close enough to somebody. They're like, God, she's calling us out. It's supposed to be the last presentation. OK, then while you're having discussions, you guys can get up and move around. <laughs> my intent is not to call you out. My intent is to make sure we have an opportunity to talk. Um, I was also telling John ahead of time, I, I appreciate very much John's enthusiasm about the topic. Um, I like to start with the expectations a little bit lower so that I'm, I have more of a chance to exceed your expectations. So would it start if I were to talk to say that I was going to talk about HR legal issues for the next hour and a half? So by the time I started, you're like, oh, thank God, she's not going to do that. We are going to talk a little bit about onboarding and training. It is a hot topic. Um, and I really like some of John's comments that I will come back to as we go through the presentation. My goal, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I, good news, bad news. Good news, I'm fully caffeinated and I'm passionate about the topic. Bad news, I'm, the bad news is I'm fully caffeinated and I'm passionate about the topic. So um, bear with me, I will get ahead of myself at some point. So first of all, we're talking about onboarding and training. And I was preparing for this presentation and I thought how many cringe moments and you'll notice when I talk about cringe moments how many cringe moments have I heard recently related to onboarding so first of all I have a friend her name is Laura um, she recently started a new job probably in the last three weeks I talked to her two to three days before she started her new job the good news for Laura was that she was starting a new job within a company that she was already familiar with the bad news is I was talking to her two days before her start date and she said, I have no idea how much money I'm making. I don't know where my office is located and I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to do. So how comfortable do you think Laura felt moving into this new role? Uh-huh, right? Can you imagine the HR person at the table? I was like, oh, no. My nephew. Alex, when he was 17, he applied for a job in a restaurant and was excited. He interviewed on a Friday. True story. He interviewed on a Friday. They were like, great, he could breathe. So they hired him, and they said, can you start tomorrow morning? And he said yes. So he showed up at like 10 a.m. the next morning. A number of people had not shown up for their shifts. So he was thrown into figuring out, and he was supposed to be a cook, right? He was in the back, but he hadn't been trained on anything. He ended up having to serve, having to cook. The only person that was in the kitchen with him when he was back there was somebody that there was a language barrier with. They never told him when he could go home, so they never gave him his shift time. He was just, he didn't know how long he was going to be there. When they finally did tell him to go home, and he worked like a 10-hour shift his first day, when he finally left to go home, they said, we'll call you tomorrow morning and let you know whether or not we need you tomorrow. And he said, OK. And as a 17-year-old boy, he set his alarm for 7 AM the next morning, right, to wait for their call. They never called. Right. <laughs> My next HR cringe moment, does anybody want to guess what happened with that employment relationship? His, his dad said, you don't need to put up with that, right? You don't need to be treated that way. He left. What pains me about that 
is that my guess is the business owner was thinking, see, it's that generation, they don't want to work. When he set his alarm for 7 a.m. to go in. <laughs> we were working with a client, this one was less recent, but it was painful enough that I had to share. We were working for a client, manufacturing setting. Um, they were having a, and I'm tying this back to the story that John gave, they were having a recruiting problem. They couldn't find enough people to fill the positions that they had. They hired somebody, they brought him in for training. The supervisor took the new employee over to the person who was going to be training him and he said, okay, you're going to be training this person for the day. And the current employee said, I don't want to train him. To which the new employee said, thanks. You let me know when you're ready to train me. Maybe I'll come back then and left, right? So lost to that employee based on that. Now, do you think that the business had a recruiting problem or a retention problem? <laughs> right? That when you have people in the door, and that's the response that they're getting. Of course, as the HR person, I said, okay, who talked to the employee who made that comment? Nobody. Nobody did. Right? And then the last one was just happened over the weekend. My friend's son, 19, um, wants to be a nurse is a nursing assistant at a nursing home. And he started over the summer, this is what he wants to do. He worked in a nursing home all of his first year of college. And he can't figure out how to get shifts because he's getting misinformation about what are the shift times? How do you sign up for shifts? Where are their locations? So you have a 19 year old who is passionate about the field, who can't figure out how to work and supervisors who are on the other end saying, why can't we find anybody to come work? But the processes are not in place. Now, kudos to him, he's still there. He's like, I am gonna, I am gonna, I'm gonna figure out this system and I'm gonna find out who I need to talk to to be able to get shifts. But how many people he talks about having left because of that experience too. So as I was thinking about these stories, there are three things that came to mind. One, this is not industry specific, right? It's across the board about industries. Two, you don't have to dig very deep to hear these situations. How many of you have heard recently of situations where somebody has been onboarded and they've had situations similar to what I've heard? Right? Good share of hands are coming up. So it's not just me as the HR person because there, people do have the urge to tell me these situations just because they know it's gonna bother me so much. And three, I guarantee I would be willing to bet that none of these organizations had any ill intent, right? With the restaurant, do I think they had ill intent? No, do I think they were really busy on what was happening at the time? Damn straight, right? We have customers, people didn't call in, we need to get work done. The impact that that has on boarding and the importance of being intentional about your onboarding is a big impact, right? So that's why we're going to focus on that today. So why me? As John said, I started PeopleSpark Consulting with Aaron. We started in 2018. Um, I don't think we've changed that number on how many years experience we have. In my mind, the plus sign just keeps getting bigger. But I refuse to add any numbers to that number. Uh, we do focus on business and HR strategy along with leadership development, as Jess mentioned, and we work primarily within agriculture. How many of you have been to either a conference or an event and seen either Aaron or myself speak? Just to let you know, we will be at CEC and Jeeves. So if you wanna see us again, we will be there. So we focus that most of our clients, 95% of our clients are in agriculture, feed mills, feed retailers, ag retailers, uh, co-ops is who we primarily work with. I do have a resource for this presentation, so if you text CONVEY to 55444, I will give you an onboarding plan template. I'm not gonna tell you what's in it, because then you're gonna be like, oh, there's her presentation, I'm gonna now duck out. So I'm not gonna give you details of it. If you're like, yeah, I'm not ready to sign up yet because I don't know how good this information is going to be, you can hold off, I have this slide at the end. But if you're interested now, text CONVEY to 55444. All right, so I want you to remember a time. This is where we're gonna get close to the discussions, talking to the person next to you. I want you to remember a time. Remember the last time you were hired into a new company. 
Some of you may be like, oh, that was six months ago, I'm fine. Some of you may be like, that was 30 years ago, nice, nice try, right? But remember the last time you were hired into a new company, okay? I want you to think about and talk with the person next to you. How did you feel that first week? How did you feel as that new employee coming in? And here's the biggest thing. What did your manager or team do that helped you feel welcome, motivated, invested in this new role? What made you, what did they do that made you think like, I made the right decision by coming here, okay? So I'm going to give you two minutes to answer those two questions, I realize some of you may have to go back to the Wayback Files. It may take a while for it to come forward. Two minutes, go. We'll take one more minute. All right, so I should have qualified this ahead of time. You will use this information later, so I hope you actually did talk about it. Um, also, I noticed See how passionate they are? All right, so let's come back together. I noticed that you started talking right away, and I don't know if that means you had all of these amazing experiences you want to share, or how many of you had the types of experiences that I shared earlier. Were you sharing your positive ones, or did you have to get through the cringe ones first? <laughs> How many of you got to the positives, but you started with the cringe ones first? No? All right, just, just a few. You may not see it, the hands were like this. They did, all right. We'll come back to that, because I want, we'll start to apply that to what we see as we onboard employees. So here's my other thing, when we come, so Aaron and I present a lot at agricultural conferences. What I realized after several conferences is that we never have graphs or charts, but everybody else has graphs or charts. Right, what's the market gonna look like? And there are always graphs and charts, so I totally added a graph to my presentation so I could say I had one. So here's my graph. This is a J-curve. I like to call it a, a productivity dip, is the term I use. The official term from the website that I'm using is a J-curve. But it's what you can expect when somebody is learning something new. Right, you have a current state, now, as you're learning something new, what tends to happen is stakeholders, so that top line, stakeholders, leaders, managers, employees, are like, oh, this is going to be great, right? This is the rose-colored grasses. It's going to be glasses, grasses, glasses. It's going to be wonderful. What usually happens is there's this productivity dip. So what actually happens most of the time is this bigger dip where performance goes down and it takes a while for it to come back up. Now this is talking about it in terms of change management, that our goal when we prepare people for learning something new is to flatten and shorten that dip. So in this case, it talks about it in terms of change management. This is what it means for when we're talking about onboarding. Like when you start as a new employee and you're super excited that you have a new employee who's starting, you're like, yes, this is gonna be great. It's totally gonna reduce the pressure of the organization. Yay, I'm sure they're gonna learn real quick. So we have those, that's what we mistakenly expect. This is what can happen if we don't have intentional onboarding or training. 
To me, this doesn't go far enough because while the dip goes down, if there isn't onboarding or training or an intentional onboarding or training, that never comes back up. It does this and then they leave. Or it does this and they're not productive, right? So our goal when we're talking about onboarding and training, we need to recognize that there will be that productivity dip. There is a learning curve that people will have. Our goal is to flatten it and shorten it. So there's, there's my graph for today. I'm gonna have to do that for other presentations in the future just to be cool with charts and graphs. All right, so here is, I know you know this, it's also fascinating to hear the statistics. So when we talk about flattening that dip and shortening it, organizations with a standard onboarding process experience 50% greater new hire productivity. Raise your hand if you want 50% greater new hire productivity. I feel like that's an amen moment. Amen, yes, that's what we want. 70% of employees who liked and excelled at their jobs had a streamlined onboarding process. Yes. Now this is talking about productivity. As John was talking about earlier, this is also about retention. How quickly does somebody decide whether or not they want to stay at an organization or at a business? How quickly? First week. Sometimes within the first two hours. Oh, I don't know if this was a good choice. When you show up and the person is like, oh, I forgot you were starting today. I have a meeting, but you sit down and you read the handbook and we'll connect later. <laughs> it's good times, good times. All right. A good onboarding experience improves long-term job satisfaction by more than 2.6 times. The more satisfied somebody is, the more engaged they will be. And 69% of employees are more likely to stay with a company if they experience great onboarding. If we can get people to stay three years. Um, we were working with a company, I'll use one of the examples that we have with them later. We were working with a company and they were like, oh, if we could get them to stay past those 30 days. Like the first 30 days are the most critical point for us. So it wasn't even three years, it was if we can get them past the first 30 days, they're more likely to stay. So when we think about onboarding, I'm going to talk about onboarding in a couple of different ways. We're gonna talk about onboarding to the business, on, onboarding to the team, and onboarding to the job. Onboarding to the business is bigger picture. That was my cool morph transition. I do at least one in every PowerPoint presentation. It's my excitement. So onboarding to, the, onboarding to the business is that bigger picture, why? What is the business trying to accomplish? Why are we in business? Who are our customers? What is our industry? What's the value that we bring to the industry and the customers that we have? So onboarding to the business is that bigger picture. Onboarding to the team is who, right? Who are we working with? Who is the team that we're connecting with? Onboarding to the job is the what. Now, what do I need to do? So I want you to, oh, see there, I got too far ahead of myself. All right, so now I want you to go back to your group, and I want you to think about, you identified what managers and team members did to make you feel invested in that role, and like you made a good decision, that you were excited to be there. So in your group, I want you to talk about of those things that you identified, were they part of onboarding to the business, onboarding to the team, or onboarding to the job, the tasks of what you were doing? One minute, go. About 15 more seconds. Yeah. 
All right, let's come back together. For those of you who identified what a manager or team member did to make you feel like you made the right decision, that you were invested in this job and excited to be there, how many of those things were related to the why, the bigger picture about the business? So you learned something about the business, what the business was doing. Raise your hand a little bit higher, because again, I'm seeing a lot of this. Raise your loud and proud. Okay, how many of you in that experience or that, um, what that team member or leader was, was more related to onboarding as the team? Okay, how many it was job related or job specific? All right, did you see? When you look at your onboarding and training, so I would say a majority, I didn't, I didn't get a good count there, it wasn't my official statistical assessment, but there were several of you who had onboarding to the business, a majority of you seemed to be onboarding to the team, the lesser amount was onboarding to the specific job that had the biggest impact on you. When you reflect on your onboarding and training, where do you tend to spend most of your time? The job. Where do you think you can have the biggest impact? Team, right? And from the show of hands, team, business, job. That is not to minimize the impact of somebody knowing their job and knowing it well. It's more to look at if you don't have some of those other things, what you do for what somebody is doing for the job is going to matter less because they won't feel a part of the bigger picture. They won't feel a part of that team. So they'll be less invested in what that means for your job. All right, so I said I'd give a couple of examples of how we have worked with some of our clients on this. So first of all, I'm gonna show you two steps, right? We have a staircase on your left and we have a staircase on your right. Which one would you prefer to climb? The one on your left? or the one on your right? Show of hands. If you would rather climb the one on the left, put your hand out this way. If you'd rather climb the one on the right, put your hand out this way. Okay, I'm gonna go with more people said the one on the right. Why? It's shorter. <laughs> you can actually see the top, right? Like, I feel like if you look at that picture really close, I think you can see people up there, but I don't really know where it ends. So I default to the one on the right. For those of you who picked the left, God bless you. I'll be at the bottom. Do you know that is so funny that you are not the first person who said that? I showed this picture to Erin, and she goes, well, the one on the left has the handrail. And I thought, the handrail doesn't do me any good about 20 steps up because I'm going to be crawling Hands and knees, right? So as you're thinking about new employees and you're starting a new job, how many of you start to feel like you're standing at the bottom of the left of like, I don't know where this is leading and I don't know where the end is? Where if you break it down into more bite-sized pieces, oh, I just need to get to that next landing and then I can celebrate. And I know there's gonna be another set of 20 steps that I'm gonna have to walk up, but you can feel that progress. You know where that line is. So as you're onboarding, Give them a map. Give them a visual of what they can expect along the way. So here's an example of one that we did with a client. And as I pulled this example together, I was like, I'm gonna admit some things in here. Don't hold it against me, okay? So this is an example of a map. We actually technically called it a road map that is provided to new employees when they start. It's hard to read, I understand that. But it starts with day one. What can you expect day one? It's those first two boxes. What can you expect week one? What can you expect month one? Month one? When are you going to connect with the business? Okay. The boxes are more about what it's related to. So if you look at the yellow box or the yellow circles, they're job focused. The green circles are team focused. The red circles are when you have an intentional connection with your supervisor. Um, if you read what they say, this is not brain science. This is not, we detailed out every step. You'll notice 
this is, this is where I cringe to admit it. You'll notice that some of these are basic. Like week one, you're gonna meet with your supervisor. At the end of the week, you and your supervisor are gonna connect. It's not brain science. It is, or brain surgery, it is at least letting them know what they can expect. So this is not real detailed. This is not real complex information, but it gives them an idea of what they can expect and not only that, if somebody were to hand you a piece of paper like this at the beginning of your first day of work, what would you think? Wow, really impressive group. I got this beautiful. So this is more graphically pleasing, visually pleasing, than the content that's on it. But it makes somebody feel like, wow, they're really, they're really prepared, they're organized, they're excited to have me here. I know what I'm gonna do, even though it's not real specific information. What we did alongside that was we created a version for the leaders. So if you notice, the left-hand side are the same words as on the employee one. The right-hand side, this is color-coded. So when you have a yellow connection point, how and what you say to engage the new employees along the way. So the leaders have this at the same time to be like, oh yeah. At the end of the week, I gotta connect with my, with my team member. What am I gonna ask? Here are some questions that you can ask, right? But it gives them that aspect of, I know what to expect, I know what's coming, and man, they got their stuff put together, right? All right, the next three things I'm going to do are going to focus on onboarding to the business, onboarding to the team, and onboarding to the job. So onboarding to the business, we worked uh, with a John Deere dealer, my intent, was not to neglect all of the other individuals that support a tractor company that is not John Deere. I felt like I was gonna isolate a portion of the group of like, hey, she put a John Deere up there, I'm out. My intent was to highlight the business that we were working with at the time, okay? So we worked with a company called Prairie State Tractor. They are based in central Illinois. Is anybody familiar with Prairie State Tractor? Um, we worked with them on putting together their onboarding plan, focusing on onboarding to the business. So they have a presentation that they have, and when I say presentation, I don't mean, I mean, they, they have a, an entire deck, like 30 slides. My intent is not to say you need a 30 slide deck to be able to do this. I want you to think more about the topics that they're putting in place. So one of the things that they talked about is their history. Now they have a fascinating history because they had mergers throughout that process, leading to where they are for today. So they spent some time talking about their history. They spent some time talking about the business itself. So here is their vision, their mission, their values are included on this, but who are we and what are we trying to accomplish? They talked about their leadership team, put included pictures of leadership team. It actually gets into the detail of who reports to whom, with pictures so you can see who each person is. And they provided some information about their territory, right? Where are they located? Where do they support? Where are their customers located? So with your partner next to you, I want you to talk about two minutes. Why is this information important for a new hire? So as we're talking about history, vision, values, mission, leadership team, areas of focus, clients, locations, kind of the bigger picture of the business. Why are those things important for a new hire? And what other information would you include that I didn't include in these four slides? So I'll give you two minutes to talk about that. Go.
One more minute. All right, so first question, why is this information important? Why would this be beneficial to share with a new hire? Understanding where your business is coming from, understanding what's important to you. What else? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm part of something bigger. I'm part of something bigger. Wonderful. What other information do you think would be important to add? So knowledge is of the process, not just what the person's going to be doing, but what that means across the location or across the business. We've had cases where we work with co-ops of like, this facility only has grain. They had no idea that we had a feed mill 10 miles away, right? So they're not even seeing some of that bigger picture aspect. What else, what other information can be important? I'm going to take that a couple of ways. Of one, let's delve more into this is what it, so here's the bigger picture, this is what it looks like for us. And what I also heard in that is adding into why does this matter? How are we going to work with them? Where will we see them show up in different places, right? Some of the other information that they had included in here, because again, I didn't want to include all of their slides, um, goals, metrics, they're a John Deere dealer, so what does that mean? What are the expectations from Deere? How does that translate into their goals? So it gives people kind of that finish line, right, of what we're trying to achieve. And when I think about this, one of my favorite stories, who follows Simon Sinek? Anybody follow, follow Simon Sinek? If you don't, I totally recommend it. There is a story that Simon Sinek, he's a leadership speaker, he does a lot of different things, several books, I would recommend those as well. But he's got some really insightful stories that he shares, and he shares one story about, a brick, about two bricklayers, actually. Two different bricklayers. So you ask the first bricklayer, what's your job? And the guy says, I lay bricks. I take a brick, you know, I put down cement, I move a brick, do it again and again. It's hard work, it's hot, it's heavy. I'm a bricklayer. You ask the second bricklayer, what's your job? And the bricklayer says, I'm building a cathedral. I do that by putting down concrete, moving a block, putting down concrete, moving a block. It's hot, it's hard work, it's heavy. I'm building a cathedral. Who do you think is going to be more engaged in their job? Who feels like they'd be more engaged? I was like, are you not answering because you feel like it's a really obvious answer, or are you really torn, right? The person who feels like you can feel some of that passion of understanding the bigger picture, building a cathedral. I have another story that's similar to it about somebody putting together medical devices, right? Where, where one employee, when he, he was asked to do his job, he said, I'm in, I'm in quality. I check to make sure these parts are in place. 
and I pick them up and I look at them, and if they're not, then I move them over here, and if they are, then I pass them through. That's what I do. That was the first shift employee. The second shift employee, when you asked what her job was, she said, I'm saving babies' lives. I do that by making sure these joints are in place. If they're not, I put them here. If they are, I pass them through. They were obviously making parts for incubators. But to see that every step of the way she was saving babies' lives, and I think about what that means for us in agriculture. I appreciated John's passion about how the values of rural America and the statistics that you shared about how much of our, what percentage of the population, what percentage, I mean, this is a great place to be. Agriculture is a great place to be. We have so many opportunities to talk to people about our, like for agriculture, what's our cathedral? We're feeding the world. We're we're, in many cases, we're keeping people alive, we're keeping pets alive, we're keeping, right? There are so many good things that we do in agriculture that we don't necessarily talk about it. And especially if you're bringing somebody in who flipped burgers last week, they're not seeing that connection. So what can we do as an organization for them to see that bigger why? To see their cathedral in what we're doing and giving that information about the organization and our bigger picture, what's important to us, is a way to do that. Now again, you don't need to have a presentation laid out. How many of you have um, company values that are posted somewhere in a conference room or a hallway or an office? Anybody? <laughs> That's, I, we were working with a co-op in Iowa at one point, and I said, what, I was talking to the HR person, I said, what are your values? And she said, hold on, I'll be right back. She had to run down the hall to look in the conference room and then she came back, right? A lot of times where the values are posted, there's usually a map, right? Make a point to take your employees to that location. Here's our values. This is what it means to us. This is how it shows up to us. Here is the location we support. Here is where, right, I've seen maps in every co-op office I've been in because you're, ta you're constantly talking about where people are located. So it doesn't have to be a slide. It can be an intentional, let's talk about, let's talk about what, what's on the wall and why it's important. Um, we were also talking to another co-op recently, talking about the leadership team, um, and the comment from one of the directors was, our general manager could go to our locations in an episode of Undercover Cop and never have to wear a disguise. Ouch. Like, that was the the other HR cringe moment, right? That tells you something. Let people know who they are, see their faces, what roles they play. Having an opportunity for them to meet some of those senior leaders as well. All right, onboarding to the team. Here are some things to consider with onboarding with the team. One, identify and introduce new employees. Now my guess is you're already doing this, right? That you're taking them around and when you're giving people the tour of here's the bathroom, here's where you can eat, here's your time clock, you're introducing team members along the way. Be intentional about it and be intentional in a way that starts building the relation. Talk to them about, this is, right, this, this is John. John is amazing at this. If you have questions about this, go to John. This is how you and John are going to work together more. This is how you'll interact, right? So what does that do for the new employee? Gives them a connection. What does that do for John? How did you feel when I said that? Fabulous. Fabulous, right? But it's that extra opportunity for you to highlight John. Oh, yeah, I am good at that. Thanks, right? So be intentional about your connections. Creates time and space for members to connect for your team members to connect. So that's beyond the, hey, John's gonna train you on this right now. Maybe it's a lunch. People bond really well over food, right? Maybe it's a lunch. Maybe it's just a time that you all get together, but create that space outside of the task that needs to be done for them to connect and meet each other. Now, if you're gonna have lunch, here's my other cringe moment. My neighbor started a new job. It was an office setting. He went into the office, he sat down, and he was texting his wife, and he said, there's pizza today. I get to meet more people, there are pizza. there's pizza today. And then he came back home, and she said, well, how did that go? And he said, I don't know, I was never invited. 
I was like, oh. And he's like, and, and I didn't know if I could go or not, but nobody said anything. When he, when he started with a company, he's like, there is a ping pong table in the break room. It's super exciting. People played all the time. Nobody, nobody ever invited him to play. So what are you doing to create that space for people to connect? And then make sure that you're sharing some of those team norms. How does the team work together? How do you communicate? What I hear commonly from clients is we're a small group, right? We're a small location, we're a small group. We all jump in and work together to figure things out. We, we have each other's backs, talk about that. Share that up front so they understand what those team norms are. So it doesn't take a lot of extra time or energy. It takes intentionality to do that. And then the last thing is onboarding to the job. We worked with a client who literally documented SOPs and that met their needs. This is a shortened version of the procedures manual that they put in place. How many of you have typed out or written out procedures manuals for the roles that you have? It is a great resource for people to go to. Like, this is a feed retail location, and it got to specifics of how do you read labels? How do you accept a check? It included pictures of what to look for to understand whether or not something is counterfeit. Right? So it was very specific, all in one place, great resource and do what makes sense for you. Having a 60-page document does not make sense for every organization. Because how many of you have those 60-page documents and either new employees have never seen them, don't know where they're located, or they're in a back room in a filing cabinet, so if somebody actually needed it, they'd have to dig for it. If it's not used, if it's not easy, people won't use them. So a couple of tips. One. Make them visual. So one of the clients that we worked with actually worked in a greenhouse, and they had visual cards of what to look for. Like, this is a picture of a healthy plant, green smiley face. This is a picture of a, of a plant that we need to watch more, yellow face. This is not good, red face, right? So it was the, here are some visuals, so that it was right in front of them, it was right at the row as they were checking plants. It was right at the beginning. But the more you can make it visual, make it easy to use, and make it easy to update. We have so many resources at our fingertips that we don't always use. So um, I'm from Minnesota. I don't know if anybody got that from the long O's. Have I given any long O's yet? Oofta? No? OK. So I'm from Minnesota. Um, my in-laws have a cabin up north. I took a group of friends for a long weekend at the cabin up north. And I had never done some of the mechanical things that you needed to do when you come into the cabin for the first time. So my husband, bless his heart, and I mean that as a good, in a good bless your heart, not a bad bless your heart, took videos of what I needed to do. So he started the video, turned things on and off, and then sent me the video. So I literally walked into the house and I was like, play the video, done. Move on to the next thing, play the video, done. How long did it take him to do that? Matter of minutes. He did the same thing with the, the lawnmower. My girls are 14, they're starting, they, they think that the riding lawnmower is fun. I'm embracing that and enabling it for as long as possible. He put together a video about how you operate the lawnmower. He went through it with them in person because that one's a little bit more complicated. There are some bigger safety issues associated with that, but then had the video with him. Um, one of the other tools, making it easy to update, some of these documents can be very difficult to update, right? Especially when you're talking about system things, how to submit an order. And you have a Word document, and then you have the thing, and then you're like, click more, click options. Has anybody gone through this process? It's painful, right? I see not, thank you, yes. And then, you have a system update and they move the button. Now you gotta, it's not on the right hand side anymore, it's on the left hand side. There are online tools that help with this. Has anybody used loom.com, L-O-O-M.com? Free videos. So you can either have camera only, 
So I will send a Loom video. If I'm sending a message to somebody, I will put together a Loom video to be able to, to talk through what I'm talking to without typing it out. Um, it also lets you screen share. So for in our own business, Erin is our CFO, God bless her. So she does payroll every week. So she put together a Loom video, recorded the screen of what buttons to hit, and then stored that in a location. Right? How do you make it easy? What are the tools beyond the, hey, we have to have this detailed out that are resources that people can use every day? Even better, save it on your company site and have a QR code. So if somebody has a question about, now how do I do that? Scan the QR code, it brings you to that document. So there are so many tools to have that in mind. So while we focus a lot on onboarding to the job, sometimes it can be very like, I'm gonna throw you in and then I'm gonna, we're gonna walk through all the steps and then I'm gonna watch you do it and then we're gonna call it good. When I want you to think about, because we focus on that so much, I didn't include a lot of that information. What I want you to think about is how can we do that even better, easier, better for them, better for us, so that it's actually a usable format. All right, so one more time to talk to the person next to you. In the last 55 minutes, 50 minutes, What's one thing that you want to do now? So what's one thing from what we talked about that you were like, yes, I need to do that. That may be a low-hanging fruit. That's something that I can do immediately without much work. So talk to the person next to you one minute. What's one thing you want to do now based on what we talked about? Ten more seconds. All right. I would love to hear three things. So I'm looking for three people to share one thing apiece. love the add-on with the videos. We get such, we have to spend some time with some of our clients to encourage them to do videos for a couple of reasons. One, people are hesitant because they're like, oh, I have to be on camera. That means I have to be polished. Or we tend to overproduce them. That some of the best feedback our clients get is if they put together an informal video talking about why, it's, why things are important to them why the culture is the way it is, that it doesn't need to be overworked. Videos are so powerful. And you already have that right there, right? The fact that you have a committee that's already working on this stuff, it's all right there. Awesome. You can send me an email and tell me when you do it. He's like, crap, I didn't know she was gonna hold me accountable to it. <laughs> I will not hold you accountable to it. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna discourage anybody else from sharing. Two more. Overwhelming. And create it bite sized. So even when they, so a lot of times we try to come up with big things, but what is the, what is the key thing that they need to know right here, right now in QR code that? So it is, so one, having it easily acceptable, accessible is important. Um, 
I have, I have another thought. I'm, I'm waiting to, I'm trying to process it in my head to see if I'm gonna change my mind once it comes out, I'm an external processor. Um, sometimes we tell them more information than what they actually need to know and we provide a lot of detail. So I would really assess what are the top three things? If I'm, if I'm talking about this task, what are the top three things that they are going to need to know on this task? Have the other stuff available, but what are the, what are the key things that we tend to, like, let's just give it a whole. But for them to be successful on this task, for them to be safe on this task, what's the one thing they need to know? I say three because the, the ideal is one, right? What's the, what's the top thing? What is the one thing? It's hard to come up with a one. So if I, can get, if I can get people to narrow down to three, I consider that a win. And how many of your organizations is a primary portion of your onboarding safety? So who is responsible, in those organizations, who is responsible for onboarding new employees? Is it safety or is it the manager? Safety? Manager? Um, safety is key. I feel like I'm going to um, preach into the choir when I say this. Um, so one, I love the focus on safety because we work, we work in dangerous environments, right? The presentation that, that was this morning talking about the safety, so it is key and important to what we do as an organization. There is a missed opportunity for that. Now when we talk about, first of all, if we talk about who has the biggest impact for onboarding, so if any of you have heard me speak, you've probably heard this statistic before. What percent of the variation between a strong culture and a lousy culture is the knowledge, skills, and talent of the team lead? Does anybody know? What percent? What percent of what an employee experiences or does is within the influence of a manager? 90? Did you say 90 or nine? 90. Any other guesses? I, did I hear a 95? <laughs> okay, well if we are playing the Price is Right rules, big fan. I'm more of a Drew person, but that's fine. If we're playing Price is Right rules, we are all over, because you have to get as close as you can without being over. It is actually 70%. I appreciate the 90. When I give the 70% statistic, what I usually get is people go, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense as a leader. That's how much influence I have over my team every day. And then there is usually this moment where it sinks in and you have this oh crap moment. Oh crap, I am responsible for 70% of what my employees experience every day. If they're not engaged, 70% is on me. If they're, not, if they're leaving, right? So there is ownership that we have. So when we talk about onboarding a new employee, who has the most impact or influence on what that new employee experiences? Right, the direct manager. There are, it's important that we bring in the subject matter experts, the HR people, nobody wants to, nobody wants to fill out the HR paperwork. HR doesn't even wanna do that, but we know we have to, right? They're subject matter experts. Safety is a subject matter expert. It is important to us. It's important to our values. It's important to us for a legal risk perspective. So it's important to include those subject matter experts. And it's also important that we're reinforcing it with our leaders. So once safety is done with that, right? Once safety is done with the onboarding of here's the presentation. So first of all, if it is solely about safety, is the, if, if that is the focus of your onboarding plan now, one, I would tie it back to our goals 
and what does this really mean? Because sometimes if we're only getting into policies and procedures, it feels like a check the box of like you're just doing this because you have to. That if we're tying safety back to, no, this is important to us as a business. We want you to go home in the same condition that you showed up in. We support each other. We support, you know, having conversations about unsafe acts, calling people out on unsafe acts, making sure that your coworkers are being safe, right? So you're talking about the bigger picture of why it's important beyond the activities and then reinforcing it with the managers. So when the managers are talking about the team, when they're talking about the job, they're reinforcing that as well. So you're getting to some of that bigger picture. I feel like I didn't answer your question. Mm -hmm. And that's not to minimize safety. To me, that's an opportunity to highlight it even more. So that was two. What's a three? Or a question. I, I'll go with either. My flight's not till 5.53. I got a lot of time. <laughs> One more thing that stood out to you. And you don't feel like you could say that? No, I'm just kidding. Um, one, those messages are difficult. Um, two, this isn't intended to be a plug. It's going to sound like one. Um, some of how you lean into those conversations is one of the focuses of our leadership development program. So much in what we do, while it's focused on how are you leading team members? We talk about it in terms of how do, you, how do you communicate expectations, and I mean that expectations all the way around, to employees, to peers, and to leaders, and how do you communicate those in different ways? Um, so if you're interested in more information, let me know. Um, you know, to me, the biggest thing about that is being clear about the impact. A lot of times, so as leaders, we tend to assess ourselves based on our intent. I'll let you think about that one for a minute, right? And, and you hear that when people communicate back of like, well, that's not what I meant, right? My daughters are twins, right? I didn't mean to hurt her. Yeah, I know, you did. Your intent wasn't to hurt her. The impact was you hurt her. So a lot of times when we assess ourselves and our behaviors, we're thinking of the intent, we're not necessarily thinking about the impact. So communicating concerns and issues, if you focus on the impact, what's the impact of them missing that deadline? One, it makes it less, per I don't wanna say less personal, but you're not questioning their intent, right? You're not saying they're a bad person, you're saying that this action caused this pain point for you and your team. But a lot of times we don't necessarily talk about what the impact, we, we feel the impact. We don't always talk about the impact. So being clear about what the impact is. When this decision was made, it impacted this and this and this, which resulted in, um, I get hit or miss on this. Uh, it would be even better if, so you can use those words, it would be even better if. It would be even better if we could make these decisions two days earlier because that would resolve this. So 
the it would be even better if sometimes can feel passive aggressive. Um, in some cases, it's, it's helpful because it doesn't put the other person on the spot. You're not saying what they did was wrong. You're saying it would be even better if they did it another way. My coworker introduced me to that, to that term, and she was having a conversation with me about something else. We were talking about training or facilitating or something, and she was like, Kristen, it would be even better if, and I was like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. And she goes, how did that feel? Because I was just testing out that language on you. How did that feel when I said even better with? I said, well, it would have been even better if you didn't tell me that's what you were trying to do in the conversation. So, but sometimes those phrases can help. Um, the other two phrases, these are our two favorites, totally off topic here. My intent is, my intent is not. It's a concept, concept called contrasting statements. It's from the book Crucial Conversations. Has anybody read Crucial Conversations? Oh, bonus points. Um, contrasting statements, my intent is, my intent is not. My intent is not to put you on the spot. My intent is to make sure we hit that deadline in the future. So it, it helps be clear on why you're having the conversation. You're not trying to be a jerk. You're not questioning their decision, you're not questioning, you wanna make sure you're hitting the deadline. Is that helpful? What other questions, comments do you have? I'm totally taking over your role now, moderating, asking questions. Oh, and I'm about out of time, I have four minutes, all right. So, a couple of things. One, if you wanna download, so, the onboarding plan template, now that I've been through the content, I can tell you what it is. It is a spreadsheet. It is an Excel spreadsheet um, that has four tabs. So one tab is necessary paperwork, because as an HR person, of course, I had to include that. One tab is on how do you onboard to the business, onboard to the team, onboard to the job. It includes topic areas and kind of questions you can answer in each of those. Like when we talk about, okay, we should give business goals, there are questions that you can answer to help you formulate that. I also included, in addition to the onboarding template, I also included one of our resources on interview questions because onboarding is partially about setting expectations and standards. We can do that before the interview is over to start to communicate why it's important. So for example, I was working with a client on interviewing training for their leaders and we were talking about how to structure good interview questions, and their teams came up with this, so I can't take credit for it. But one of the questions they wanted to ask in their interviews is, tell me about a time someone asked you to do an unsafe act. And I was like, ooh, that's a good one, write that down, that's a good one, right? What does that communicate to candidates as they're interviewing and you ask them that question? What does that tell them? What's important to you? Safety. I didn't hear you, but I saw you mouth the words there, right? Safety is important, you're setting it up up front. The other thing is we did write a book, um, so if you're interested in purchasing the book, the QR code, see, of course I had to use my own QR code. There's a QR code that takes you to Amazon if you're interested in that. Um, also, if you did text convey to 55444, you get an email back with that onboarding template. My contact information is there. So if you have further questions, my, my direct email, Kristen at peoplesparkconsulting.com is in that email that you get back. So if you have questions, please let me know. Thank you. Oh, I have two minutes left. Thank you, thank you so much, Kristen. So here, here's the deal, y'all. We are right out of time, but we, we, we cheated. It didn't surprise me. It was a couple of my board members over here that did it. They asked questions during the, <laughs> during the presentation, which is fine. So, but Kristen, I, I actually do just have, have, have one. Um, and this question is very specific, though, to agriculture, right? Mm. So a lot of us that were born, raised on a farm, are in rural America, or maybe have worked our entire careers in agriculture, there's a lot of terminology that we take for granted. <laughs> I, I keep thinking about your example. The young person that the day before they were flipping burgers, and now they're doing whatever. Kristen, we have people that we hire that regardless of education level, they may not know the difference between kernel, spelled with the letter K, and kernel spelled with the letter C. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Is the onboarding and training the same 
or is it modified for the person that doesn't know the difference between kernel with K and kernel with C? See, I love that example. So we love being in agriculture. We brought on interns who did not have experience in agriculture. We were talking about how many of our businesses work in silos. And when we said it, we were thinking silos in terms of feed typically works with feed. Grain usually works with grain. So we were thinking like departments and functions. He literally thought we meant that people were working in silos. And I was like, well, that, I mean, sometimes they do. Sometimes, sometimes that does happen. Um, I think that is a great question here because a lot of that we take for granted. And as somebody not born and raised in agriculture, so I didn't start working in the agriculture industry until I started at Land O'Lakes in 2007. How many times I sat in meetings writing down words that I didn't know what they meant, right? Um, so I think a great way to do that is one, have a resource, knowing that we're hiring more people that don't have that experience and background, have a resource and leverage your new employees to figure that out. Okay, you're new here, we're excited to have you here, we need your help. As we're having conversations, write down the words that you hear that you may not have context for. I wouldn't put it in terms of that you may not understand, right? But what are the words that you're hearing that you need more information or more definition on? Because we forget those things internally. Like, well, doesn't everybody know what scours is? No, not everybody does. Okay. Um, but what are those words? That's, that's the one that Erin didn't know that she had to write down and figure out later, so it's always top of mind for me. Um, but what are those words so we can start to compile those? for people who may not have that background or experience. But that way, it, I don't think it needs to be separate. I think it needs to take a little bit more in terms of the why, that bigger picture, that it's not just about this and this and this. It's why we do what we do and the impact that we have. But using your new hires to gather that information would be helpful because they'll pick up on things that you didn't pick up on and they'll be like, oh, this is so cool, they asked me my thought, I just started and they wanted my opinion. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. I, I had a whole page of my own questions, so I'm sure you guys do as, as well. We're, we're, we are out of time. Uh, Kristen, maybe you can hang around for sure. a, a bit if folks maybe would want to approach and bounce a question off of her. But wow, what an incredible topic. What a great way to finish the conference. How about a round of applause for Kristen?